chapter 9, the Gospel of John, chapter 9. Are you there? Yes. Yeah. Alright, let's look down to verse 24. And we're going to assume a lot of the story before we begin our context here. But we'll, we'll catch up just a little bit before we, uh, before we get to where we're going. Verse 24. Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or no, I know not. One thing I know that whereas I was blind, now I see... Then said they to him again, What did he to thee? How open he thine eyes? He answered them and said, I've told you already, and you would not hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? Will you also be his disciples? Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, and but we're Moses' disciples. We know that God spake unto Moses. As for this fellow, we know not from whence he is. The man answered and said unto them, Why, herein is a marvelous thing that ye know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened mine eyes. Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. The answer and said unto him, Thou hast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And they cast him out. Well, we'll pray, and then we'll examine 
the passage of Scripture and the Savior that that context is all about. So, Father, please help us this morning, both with our understanding as well, God, as we look at how the people responded to who Jesus, the Son of Man, was. And God, I pray that you would give us understanding and knowledge in a personal way of who you are, we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. All right. Well, we're going to do just a little bit of review because it has been broken up just a little bit. I had Brother Devin preach for two weeks. And I'll be honest with you, it just seems like, a, like forever since we were in the Gospel of John. It's funny how fast some things can uh, happen and then how long some things can seem. But does it seem like it's been a while to you since we were in the Gospel of John? It does for me. So let's do some review and let's see if you can teach me some things or remind me of some things that we've learned in the Gospel of John. Okay, John is a Gospel, right? But it's different than the other three Gospels. So what would be different about the Gospel of John as in comparison with Matthew, Mark, and Luke. What? Okay. The, okay, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, each from different perspectives, help us to understand this is who Jesus is. And we could say that Jesus and Gospel are interchangeable. In other words, we know the word Gospel means good news, right? Jesus is the gospel. Would there be any theologian that would argue that point? Well, would there be anyone with a good argument that would argue Jesus is not the gospel? Now, I understand the word gospel could have other contexts, but in the context that the gospel is for us, the gospel is Jesus and everything that Jesus is, said, and was or did. Could we agree on that this morning? Yes, sir. And that's really the perspective of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Matthew tells us Jesus is the king of the Jews. And he's really presenting it from the lineage of uh, Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. Judas begat Pharaoh and Ter uh, or, uh, Azera, Tamar, and Pharaoh begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aramid, uh, Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Solomon, Solomon begat Boaz, all the way down to the entire lineage of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is the king of the Jews. Matthew presents it as Mark presents Jesus Christ, and he really gives us a lot of the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, Jesus Christ is the Son of Man. He's the Son of God. He is God. He's, so he talks about Jesus in a way that we can relate to. And that Jesus was that, wasn't he? Uh, Luke gives us a lot of detail about Jesus. and gives us miracles that Jesus did. John's Gospel uh, is not synoptic. Now, when we say synoptic, what we mean would be that Matthew, Mark, and Luke oftentimes would tell stories about what Jesus did, and you'd find the same three stories in the synoptic Gospels. Uh, what's the book that used to be? Was it Baker's? Is it, thank you. We've got a theological student here that can tell us Baker's uh, synopsis, right? A synopsis of the Gospels where you could, it takes all three of the Gospel accounts and it. You know, I think does it have three columns in? Is that how it does it? So you read it in three columns: Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Same story, different perspective. And it's a neat way to read through the Gospels. You could do the same thing, I'm sure, in a PDF format or online or on your phone today. I'm sure, without even Baker's is it uh, Baker's analogy of the Gospel? Harmony. Harmony of the Gospel. That's what they call it. Okay, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are synoptic, but Baker did not include John, the Gospel of John, in that harmony. Why? Well, because John wrote uh, for a completely different reason. Let's look at our theme verse in John, shall we? Uh, go, go to, if you would with me, to the end of the letter, or at the end of the Gospel. Uh, if you would find, please, chapter 20. John chapter 20. And look at verse 30 and 31. These are our theme verses. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Okay, so what was the purpose of the Gospel of John? Well, John wrote his Gospel explaining this is how to believe in Jesus. Matthew said this is who Jesus is. Mark said this is who Jesus is. Luke said this is who Jesus is. And John said this is how you receive Jesus. That's the difference between the Gospels. It's very fascinating as well that in the few cases where John shows the same 
accounts tells the same story that the other Gospels did. For instance, the story of Peter walking on the water. It would be a classic one we looked at a few weeks ago. When John tells the story of Peter walking on the water, he talks about Jesus walking on the water, but never mentions that Peter was even there. Why? Because he's not talking about Peter and faith. He's talking about how to receive Jesus. And it really gives you that focused perspective on how to receive Jesus. Now, we're still in a portion of the Gospel of John where we're looking at encounters that Jesus had with different individuals and how because of the way that Jesus reached them, how they received Jesus, or in some cases, rejected Jesus. At the beginning, we saw them only receiving Jesus. So you tell me, uh, what are some examples of people who received Jesus? What's the first, most famous one that we preach the Gospel from? Nicodemus. Yeah, Nicodemus, right? So Jesus, the man came to Jesus by night. He was a ruler of the Jews. He was a Pharisee. And Jesus said, you must be born again. And we, we, we encounter Nicodemus again in the Gospel of John. We encountered him a few weeks ago when we were preaching. I believe it was Easter or the week before, uh, be, before Resurrection Sunday. We, we saw Nicodemus asking the question, Doth our law judge a man before it hear him? We see Nicodemus again at the burial of Jesus, the one that goes and requests permission to bury his body. Well, Nicodemus, my friend, received the gospel that Jesus preached to him. And what was the gospel? The gospel was salvation is by faith. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So the illustration of Moses and the serpent in the wilderness... Remember it? You know the, the account. You know the story. Uh, the people murmured against Moses. God sent poisonous vipers to bite them. And then after that had happened, uh, God judged them. They repented. And God had them lift up a serpent in the middle, middle of the wilderness. And that was pretty, a pretty unique story. A very unique story. There are uh, a lot of mythological stories behind it, but the reality of it is, is that the people looking at the serpent is a picture of faith. It is, that's how faith works. And Nick, any person who gets saved, gets saved how? By faith. And how do you exercise faith? By looking to Jesus. Okay. Now, that was Nicodemus. What are some other examples of encounters? Woman at the well. The woman at the Samaritan woman. Jesus must needs go through Samaria. And we know that when He came, He, he was, wanted the Gospel to be preached to the lost uh, house of Israel. But Jesus went through the regions of Samaria where the people would have had Jewish heritage but would have worshipped in the mountain like pagans. And the Samaritans were an outcast bunch of people and Jesus sat down at the well. He was weary and as, as well as Sychar, his disciples went into town to get food. And this woman came and he asked her to draw water for him. And right away she knew he was Jewish. She said, how is it that thou being a Jew ask us, Water, ask us me, water of me being a Samaritan. And Jesus gave her the encounter, gave her the illustration of the fact that if she asked him, she could have living water and she'd never thirst again. And what we see ultimately is that this woman is an idolater. She wants to discuss religion with Jesus. She, remember, she contrasted. You know, the Jews say we have to worship at Jerusalem, but our fathers worship here in this mountain. And Jesus said, Believe me, you know, the hour comes. You're not going to worship God in this mountain or in Jerusalem, but salvation is of the Jews. God's a spirit. They that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And Jesus confronted the idea of religion, that a person can establish a, a faith on the basis of logic. God's a spirit, so we can worship Him anywhere, anyhow we like to. Is it true that God's a spirit? Does that mean that we can worship anywhere or any way that we wish? Well, no, see, see, the problem is you, that's the same with any, any error, isn't it? It's always an admixture of truth. Error always has truth in it, doesn't it? The fact is God's a spirit. God can hear you. God is everywhere. God's not, there's not a place that God doesn't see. But when God wanted to be worshipped by the Jews, or when God wanted to be worshipped, and He was working through Israel, where did He want to be worshipped at? Jerusalem. <coughs> at Jerusalem. We worship God His way, not our way. You know, a lot of people are almost right. 
but they're still wrong about worshiping God. And this woman became a believer in Jesus. The, then, then what happened right after that? Who else met Jesus? It's connected with the Samaritan woman. Yeah, the town came out, and they heard, and they said, now we believe not because you told us, but because we've heard for ourselves. And they got saved. All right, who else have we seen? Who else have we seen have an encounter with Jesus? It's a famous one. What? Okay, the woman taken in adultery. They brought this woman, the Pharisees brought this woman to Jesus and said, this woman's taken in adultery in the very act. And they said, you know, what are you going to do? The law says, and they wanted Jesus to either enforce the law and kill a woman or and, and uh, they would create a lot of problems. Or they wanted him to say the law didn't apply, make an exception to the law so that it would invalidate him because he would be uh, in conflict with Moses. So they're trying to create a conflict with Jesus and Moses. And of course, Jesus' response was, He that is without sin, let him cast the first stone. They went out, the Bible says, from the eldest and the youngest. And he asked the woman, she remained, she didn't go out. He asked her, he said, where are those thine accusers? And she said, you know, does any man condemn thee? She said, none, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. So we see different types of people Jesus saves. Jesus could save a man, a rich ruler of the Jews like Nicodemus. Jesus could save a, a woman of Samaria who is had five husbands, has lived with a man that isn't her husband. Jesus saved the people that came out of the village. And Jesus saved a woman taken in adultery. And what do we conclude thus far as we look at the kind of people <coughs> Jesus saves? What's our natural conclusion? What? There's no limit. You can save anyone. Jesus can save anyone who comes to Him by faith. Now that's what John is explaining. These are the kind of people Jesus saves. And somewhere there ought to be a chord resonating with you and someone Jesus saves. There's just enough variety to the kind of people that Jesus saves. Here's this religious good man who is well esteemed by the Jews and he's a leader of them, Nicodemus. And Jesus could save a guy like that. Here's this uh, here's this low-down woman that's had five husbands and is living with a man that isn't her husband. And Jesus can save a woman like that. Here's a woman who was taken in adultery in the very act and she's condemned by everybody around her. And Jesus can save a woman like that. And today we're looking at a man who was blind. And let's look at how the story began because the disciples asked a good question. And it's a philosophical question. Uh, that they asked, and Jesus gives a very good answer. Verse 1 of chapter 9. As Jesus passed by, He saw a man which was blind from His birth. Okay, so a man was blind from when? Birth. From His birth. <clears throat> his disciples asked Him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that He was born blind? Now, this is interesting because this is one of the instances where we don't have the Pharisees coming and asking Jesus a wrong question. The Pharisees always ask questions Normally when they asked the question, they weren't seeking an answer. They were looking to entrap him or to get him to say the wrong thing. They were trying to trick him. And it was always incredible the answers that he gave. But the disciples are asking a question that's probably much like the ones that you and I would ask. Have you ever had something happen in your life which when it occurred, you wondered if it was the hand of God in judgment or chastisement? Or you didn't know, you just didn't know, you didn't know uh, whether you've done wrong. Is God judging me or is this one of those things that I have to go through to work patience? Is there something I should be repenting of? Now, we're not preaching that message today, although some of y'all look like, well, go ahead and preach the message, Pastor. That's one that we could use. Well, let me just let me just summarize a message we could preach from the Scripture very, very plainly. Chastisement's always in kind. Chastisement's always in kind. In other words, if God is judging you for something, believe me, you'll know it because it'll be related. Uh, let me, I, I guess the audience would be okay here this morning. I hope it wouldn't be offending anyone. But do you know that people that sin the sins of fornication oftentimes have uh, things that come along with that? Judgment that's in kind. They have consequences that's in kind uh, with that type of judgment. And they're like, oh, you know, why is this happening to me? Well, you know why it's happening to you. It's because of what you did. Does that make sense to you? 
You know, you steal somebody's car and you're driving 120 miles an hour down the highway and you slam into somebody and you injure an innocent person, you get taken to court and, you know, and you go to jail and you're in jail and you're like, you know what, blessed are those which are hunger and thirst, blessed are those which are persecuted for righteousness sake, you know. Well, that's not righteousness. Like, why am I in prison? I'm, I'm like the Apostle Paul here in prison. You know, I'm just going to sing hymns and praises to God. No, you're in prison because you stole somebody's car and because you damaged somebody's life. You wrecked someone's life and these are the consequences of your wrongdoing. Uh, chastisement's in kind. And when God judges, my friend, He doesn't play some kind of silly game where He is just you know messing with people's minds. Like, guess whether you're being judged or not. No, we don't have a cruel God like that. We have a God who is a loving Father, and if something happens, and you don't know why it is, and you're being honest about it, it's because God's working patience in your life. And, and it's one of those things that's a result, not only of the curse, but it's one of those areas where you're going to be able to see God's grace in your life, and you're going to be able to overcome, and you're going to be able to testify of God's goodness later, and God's going to use it for your ministry and those sort of things. But it might be that something's happening in your life and it's a consequence of your sin. And the reason for it is God's trying to get your attention. He wants you to confess your sin. Because He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. God wants to restore you to fellowship. That's why you're being chastised. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. Okay, so now we know these things, don't we? That, does, that, that, does that help us uh, to be able to relate? Okay, so this man, the, the disciples are asking the age-old question. This man's blind from birth. What did he do wrong to be born blind? You know, it you know, gets us this whole karma thing, you know. God knew what he was going to do, and so he just judged him before he did it. <laughs> Let me tell this funny story. Try to turn this off so my mom don't hear. All right. My mom. <laughs> it happens, doesn't it? Uh, the fact is, is that God doesn't do that. God knows everything you've ever done, and he doesn't judge you uh, in, in sort of a. Uh, you know, I'm just going to just I'm going to sock it to you, and you'll figure out why later on because you're about to, you're going to do something. God doesn't play silly games, okay? So the disciples did have the question: Was this man who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Maybe his parents did something, and so you know this terrible thing happened to him to teach his parents a lesson. Our our sin does affect others, doesn't it? What we do does affect others. Paul said, he said, "No man liveth unto himself, and no man dieth unto himself." There are people who say, it's my life, it's my business, I'll do what I want. And what they do absolutely affects everybody around them. Children, what they do breaks the hearts of their parents. It hurts their, their friends. It, it hurts people around them. Parents, what they do hurts their spouses and hurts their children and hurts their family. Everything that we do affects someone else. But that isn't the reason this man was born blind. The reason this man was born blind is so that for eternity he could give God the glory. Now think how cool this is. And let me just ask you a question. Consider this. Would you be willing to be blind for, oh, I don't know, about 38 years or so, so that for eternity God could have the glory? No. Yeah, some would, some wouldn't, right? Well, this man wasn't asked permission. <laughs> but all of us are created for God's glory. Hear me now. The circumstances in your life are for God's glory. And you'll either glorify Him in them, or you'll have a wrong response. But this man is a classic example of an individual who with his circumstances that he was born with, being blind. He glorified God. Boy, that's great singing. Tell her, just keep it right on up. Um, you all used to babies, right? Everybody here knows babies talk. Okay, she's sweet and happy, and so it's no big deal. So you can smile at her, but try not to distract me. She doesn't distract me, but you do. You're, Tasha, don't be sorry. It's, this, is, this is just fine, okay? We, we don't have our normal people in the nursery today, and so it's more difficult, and we're glad we like the way she sings. You know? <laughs> She's happy, man. She's a great singer. All right. Uh, let's, let's look at, at verse 3. All right? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while I stay, the night cometh, when no man can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Verse 6, When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, and made clay of the spittle, and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is, by interpretation, sent. He went his way, therefore, and washed, and came see. 
Now I ask the question, how many of you would want to be born blind? Let me ask another question. How many of you would want to be healed by someone spitting on the ground and making clay and putting it on your eyes? Why did Jesus need to do that? Now that's the question. Did, is that the way Jesus healed all the blind? No, He healed a lot of blind people. He didn't always do it that way. But this is the way He did it in particular. And the, the deal is, I don't know why Jesus did it that way. But friend, I'd be happy to have Jesus do that to me. I'd be happy to have Jesus heal me by making clay from His spit and putting it on my eyes and having me wash in the pool of Siloam. Because man, being blind and seeing is a wonderful thing. But friend, get this. We as believers need to get to a different level. We need to get to a different plane where we understand that it's even greater to be part of glorifying God than it is to be healed of something. You know, Paul learned that lesson, didn't he? Remember when he asked for his thorn in the flesh to be removed from him? And God said, My grace is sufficient for thee. Paul said, Most gladly would I rather than... It's okay, good. Alright, if God's grace is going to be sufficient. And if I'm going to glorify Him by His strength being made perfect in my weakness, then I want to be weak. I want to be weak. Now, this isn't the, the, the overarching lesson today. But friend, if God wants me to be blind for His glory, I want to be blind. And if God wants to spit on clay and put it on my eyes for His glory, I want, I want spittle and clay to be put on my eyes. You know, some of us, We'd say, well, I don't want God to work in my life that way. And it's too bad because the way God's working in your life, you probably wouldn't want either. Is your life for the glory of God? See, what Jesus here is teaching, the underlying doctrine that's plain as the nose on your face, is that every person was created for the glory of God. You are created for the glory of God, and your circumstances are for God's glory. So you and I need to have the kind of... You know, some people are like, hey, you know, I, I, rebuke, I rebuke that. I don't want that. I can't have that in my life. God, I can't... God, you've got, to, you've got to remove this from me. God, this is good. This is not good. This is evil. You'll never be ready for the grave with that attitude. Do you hear me? Friend, let me give you a reality check. Jesus said if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. You're going to live for Jesus. Persecution's coming at some stage, at some point, some level in your life. You need to be ready for it or you'll fail in it. You, you, won't, you won't see God's goodness, God's hand in it. Um, not only persecution, but death is coming. Death is coming. Now, uh, friend, death for a believer is never spiritual death. You're never going to be separated from God. But this body is going to decay and it's going to die, and you're going to get the news someday. Man, this last month, so many people... Uh, have gotten bad news. Bad news about their health. And friend, every time somebody gets bad news about their health, I'm reminded someday that news might be my news. That could be about me someday. And the question is whether or not I'm going to glorify God because friend, I don't want to live in this world forever. Something's going to have to happen. Sometimes something's going to have to happen where I get to go and to be in the presence of God. And if I have this mindset that nothing that's bad, nothing that's difficult, nothing that's hard for me is allowed to happen, my friend, I'm not going to be ready to die. Now, death's coming whether you're ready for it or not. I've said many times, I've seen many individuals go to meet the Lord. I've met people that have, by God's grace, they have literally fallen asleep glorifying Him. They've gone out rejoicing. I've met people that have gone out in terror. I've been with people that have been terrified as they die. You know what makes the difference? What makes the difference is your attitude toward the curse. See, death is part of the curse. It'll happen. But you can die with God's grace, and you can see it in perspective of eternity, that death is already defeated, that the grave has already lost, and that Christ has won the victory over death in the grave. Or you can have an attitude that I, I, I can't die. I can't accept this. Friend, you're accepting, you're, you're rejecting a thing will not stop it. This man's attitude toward being blind could have been that he was bitter for the entirety of his life.
but evidently he was not. And Jesus said the reason he was born blind is so that he could glorify God. Okay? Verse... Uh, let's just jump down to verse 13. This is after he's been healed and people are talking about who healed you. They brought to, to the Pharisees him that aforetime was blind... And it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. Oh good, we can find fault with Jesus for healing a blind man on the Sabbath day. Uh, then again the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put clay upon my eyes, and I washed, and do see. So here he gave them the story. Remember when we read the account today? And he said, you know what, would you hear it again? Are you going to be his disciples? Are you going to follow him? Is that why you want me to tell the story again? So here's when he's telling the story. Uh, in... Verse 16, Therefore said some of the Pharisees, This man is not of God, because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that's a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. They say unto the blind man again, What sayest thou of him, that he hath opened thine eyes? He said, He's a prophet. So now they're quizzing this man. And here we're seeing the perspective of two individuals. We've actually been introduced to more, right? How many characters are in this story if we were to act it out like a play? Well, we have Jesus... And we have the disciples, and we have the blind man, and now we have the Pharisees. Okay? So we have Jesus, the disciples, the blind man, and the Pharisees. And I just want to kind of draw conclusions on the responses. Could we say that the disciples' response is very, very well uh, presented to us by the Apostle John, who the Holy Spirit used to give us this testimony. So what we could say about the disciples is that they... Learn their lesson. Okay, couldn't we? The disciples, we could say, learn their... Let's say it, okay? We could say that the disciples learned their lesson. Let's try it again. We could say the disciples learned their lesson. Well enough that John told us why the man was born blind. Okay, so the lesson for the disciples was that things happen for the glory of God. Okay, now there, there's... There, there's the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, what was His purpose in this? Well, not only was He teaching the lesson, but as well, Jesus was, was fulfilling the will of God or He was glorifying God. That's what He said. He says, while it's day, you got to do the things that are part of the day. And uh, He said, uh, this man was born so that God could be glorified. And here, here is the you know, Son, the Father glorified. And so He is concerned with glorifying God. Then there's the Pharisees. There's the Pharisees. Blind man we'll deal with last, but then there are the Pharisees. Now the perspective that we get from the Pharisees is that they're trying to find fault with God. Right? Now, we all have a little of this in us, don't we? The inability to rejoice with a person that rejoices. You ever met somebody that somebody did something for and Someone else is unhappy because it wasn't them. You know, there's that reason behind it isn't there. Y'all ever have a sibling like that? You know, the, the fairness sibling? It's not fair. You know, you got to go with dad and you got to go to this nice restaurant. That's not fair. That shouldn't have happened. If you're not happy that you got to have that experience, it should have happened for me. Man, siblings, when they get older, quibble over inheritance. Don't they ever seen that where they quibble over an inheritance and... You know, mom and dad gave you this, so mom and dad have to give me this. And they can't just be like, well, mom and dad gave you that, so I'm just so happy for you. That's great. It's, I should have had that. It's everything that someone else gets, they resent. And there are those people in traffic. You know what I'm talking about? You ever met the guy that can't let you behind him or in front of him? Right. You know, you slow down so you can get behind him, so he slows down. Then you speed up to, to get in the gap in front of him, he speeds up. He just doesn't want you to get another lane. And it's not like you're even going to affect him. You know, you don't care whether it's behind him or in front of him. You take where you want, buddy. I'll just take what's left. No, you don't get any of this lane. You know, that guy in traffic. That's you sometimes. I've seen you all driving. So I know that you're that person. But you know what I'm talking about? Just somebody that doesn't want somebody to get something. He just can't be happy for somebody. It's not like, hey, bud, you got in. Happy for you. And you didn't even get a fender bender. Good deal. You know, good one. You made it. Cut me off. <laughs> You're the winner. You just can't be happy for someone. Well, the fact is that realistically, the Pharisees have this attitude of, 
you know, here's a guy that's blind from birth, right? They know he was blind from birth. It's brought to their attention that he's been healed, and they're trying to figure out what's wrong about it. Well, it's a Sabbath day. You can't, can't heal somebody on the Sabbath day. I mean, we know the law, don't we? That if the oxen's in the ditch, you're supposed to get the oxen out. You're going to tell God He can't do good on the Sabbath day? Well, let's just go ahead and, and, and trickle down that one, shall we? Are you going to tell any person they can't do good on the Sabbath day? It's a Sabbath day, can't do good. That's nonsense, isn't it? So what is the heart's attitude behind the Pharisees not being happy for the blind man being healed on the Sabbath day? Well, it's just unbelief. It's just unbelief. They don't want to believe in Jesus, and they have had something put in their face that proves that He's God. And so because it's been proven to them that Jesus is God, they're trying to find fault with Him so that they don't have to believe. Listen to me. If you're looking to invent a reason to not believe in Jesus, you'll succeed at it, but it'll be to your own detriment. Won't it? Was Jesus God? Yes. Did the miracles Jesus did prove He was God? They said to the man, is He a prophet? or what, well, what is He? He said, well, you know, He did a miracle. He's at least a prophet, okay? And now they start going after Him. I, I love this guy, too. Uh, the attitude that he gives, the, the sarcasm that he uses, the, the second, when they keep, they keep going after Him, tell us again what happened. Tell us again what happened. They, they got his parents, threatened his parents. You know, his parents are afraid of getting cast out of the synagogue. And so they're like, well, you know, ask him. They don't want to mess with him. But they called, in verse 24, then again they called the man that was blind and said unto him, give God the praise. Oh, yeah, I mean the blind man was saying, well, you know what, God's not good. I was healed today. <laughs> right? But what they're, what they're saying is, don't give Jesus the glory. Instead, give the glory to God. But Jesus is God. So they say, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. Now, do you think the blind man had a problem with praising God at this stage in his life? No. You know, some people would, though. Some people say, you know what, I'm just mad that I had to wait all these years. There are some people like that, not the blind man, though. The blind man was an example of an individual being willing to live for the glory of God. He was willing to praise God, but he was not willing to concede that Jesus was a sinner because a sinner didn't heal him. The Son of God did. And it's interesting with all the pressure that's being put on this man by the religious leaders who had it within their power to cause him a great deal of misery and did in the end. It's interesting that this man is unwilling to cave on this point or to concede it. See, he could have ended the conversation by saying, well, if you think he's a sinner, that's good with me. I don't care. You want to say he's a sinner? Fine, he's a sinner. But he wasn't, and the man knew it. Of course, he understood the attitude behind the Pharisees, and he was not willing to play their game. His parents were. They were willing to play it. But this man is saying, hey, if you want to be an unbeliever, it's not going. I'm not going to join you. I'm not going to be party to this. And so now... The next part of it, you know, then, the, then it says, they, they said unto him, What did he to thee? How open he thine eyes? Well, didn't he already tell him that? He put clay on my eyes and told me to go wash, and I did, and I was healed. That's how he did it. They said, What did he do again? And now he says, You know, I didn't tutter, okay? I'm not going to tell you again. I didn't stutter. That's, I knew a guy used to say, I didn't tutter when he get angry. But he says, I didn't stutter. I, I told you already. So I've told you already, and you didn't hear. Wherefore would you hear it again? He says, why are you asking me to tell you again? Is it because you want to be His disciples? And here he puts his finger right on their attitude of unbelief. They're not asking so that they can believe. They're asking so they can find fault, so they can justify unbelief. Again, hear me. If you're looking for a reason not to believe, you'll find it. If you're looking to justify unbelief, you'll be able to justify it in your unjust, petty little mind. Do you hear me? See, an unjust person can justify anything they wish, but the problem is, is that it doesn't make it right. Now, friend, hear me now. Listen to this. God is the judge. So many people think they're going to be able to take their religion and they're going to be able to stand before God and convince Him of their sincerity. God, I really believe that this is the way for forgiveness of sins, and that's why I didn't go to the cross and receive Jesus by faith. 
God, here's all the things I did that prove that I really believed that. Friend, you can justify things in your mind, but it doesn't prove anything because you're lying about it. You're lying to yourselves. And these Pharisees are lying to themselves to give their, themselves a justification or reason not to believe. So let's finish up. My Bible, I have to turn the page, but I go down to verse 30, and the man answered them. They said, you know, we come from Moses. We don't know who this guy is. He said, verse 30, Why, hearing is a marvelous thing that you know not from whence he is, and yet he hath opened my eyes. Now this is, the irony of it is explained here. This man says, this is incredible. You don't know how he opened my eyes? Well, let me ask y'all a question. How did Jesus open this man's eyes? You don't know how he did it? Do you? Do you? Does anyone here know how he did it? I mean, we know that he spit in the, on the dirt and he made clay and he put it on the man's eyes and told him, go wash yourself in the pool of slime. How did he heal his eyes? This man says, pretty incredible. You don't know how. He says, because the fact is none of us know how he did it, which proves that he did something that people can't do. It's incredible to me you can't figure this out. He was God. This is what the blind man told the Pharisees. Do you see it? Here it is a marvelous thing. You can't figure out how he healed me. Duh. <laughs> He's God. That's how he did it. And then he just goes on to say, Now we know that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God and doeth his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? He said, so uh, do, can you all, you know, let's, let's get it on the record where a man, you know, opened the eyes of the blind. Is there any account of that? No, there's not. You can go all the way back to creation. There's not a single account of a man being able to open the eyes of a blind person. And key there in that statement is the word man. You don't, you don't think it's God. He's a sinner. He's a man, you're saying. Well, it's really interesting that men can't do what he did, isn't it? Doesn't that kind of eliminate the possibility for him being just a man? That's what the blind man is saying. And he's saying it rather well. He said, if this man were not of God, he could do nothing. And he says that very well. They answered and said unto him, You're a sinner. <laughs> you know, this is the, the age-old argument. If you can't beat a guy, uh, it is, if you don't have logic to either defend your argument or defeat someone else, then you just attack the person. This is not a very good attack uh, because... It's sort, of, um, it's sort of one of those irrelevant statements. It would be like telling me telling Charlie, you're a Marine. And he's like, ooh. You know, hit me with another one. <laughs> They're telling a sinner that he's a sinner, and he's like, what's it got to do with this thing? You know, why is it? Now, why would they say something like that? Well, I'll tell you something, because it was an argument that would have deeply hurt them. It was an accusation which would have deeply hurt them because in their minds they were trying to justify their unbelief. And by justify, the word justify means make righteous. When we say justify something, we mean make it right or make it righteous. And they wanted to not believe in God's Son and be righteous anyway. Do you see? And so the fact that they had self-righteousness without Christ's righteousness... Here's a man who's a sinner and they levy against him the worst thing they could have said to themselves thinking it would affect him. You're a sinner. Now you tell a self-righteous person that they're a sinner and it'll set them off. You just go around telling everybody they're a sinner until you find a self-righteous person and you'll know it when you do because it will trouble them. By the way, don't be self-righteous. Don't be like that. Don't let it bother you. You know, some people can't take any kind of criticism at all. And you know why? Because you're just like a Pharisee. You have self-righteousness and you're not concerned with having actual righteousness. And so it bothers you when somebody puts their finger on the area that you're pretending. But this guy, they called him a sinner and it's like water off a duck's back. He's thinking, yeah, you know, I know you are, but what am I? You know, not really. He's saying, yes, I am. I'm a sinner. Uh, you can call me a sinner all you want to, folks. It's true. It's a fact. And it's what qualifies me for God's love. 
when we are yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. But God commendeth His love for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All you're saying to me when you call me a sinner is that I qualify for God's love, and I'll take that one. I'm not glorying in sin. Sin is what crucified Jesus. Sin is what condemned me to hell. But friend, if you want to just say about me that I am a sinner in a generic sense, then friend, all I can say is it proves God loves me. And that's this man's response. And Jesus, in verse 34, they cast him out. Verse 35, Jesus heard that they had cast him out. Now, do you remember this? We had two more people we we're going to look at. In particular, we we're going to look at the blind man and Jesus' response to him. Jesus, it says, when he had found him, he said unto him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? He answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe on him? Okay. What was the Pharisees' response to who Jesus is? They tried to find a reason to justify their unbelief. All right, now that's a little bit of a mouthful in a sentence, but uh, we know that the disciples learned their lesson, right? And the Pharisees in this story tried to find a reason to justify their unbelief. Let's try to say that together. The faster you say it together, the quicker we can go to the blind man's and go home, okay? So they tried to find a way to justify their unbelief. You ready? The Pharisees tried to find a way to justify their unbelief. Oh, well, you did it well enough on the first one time. We just leave it, okay? So that's the Pharisees. The blind man who now could see, his response was, Who is he, Lord, that I might believe? He was willing to believe. Okay, so let's just say about him, the blind man was willing to believe. Ready? The blind man was willing to believe. All right. Now, those are all the accounts, aren't they? We looked at the disciples. They learned their lesson. The Pharisees were trying to justify their unbelief. And the blind man was willing to believe. Let's tie it together. You're not Jesus. So, when it comes to groups in our story, we can really relate to three groups. Disciples, the blind man, or the Pharisees, right? The disciples learned their lesson. <laughs> The blind man was willing to believe and the Pharisees were looking for a reason to justify their unbelief. Now, when we look at this, what do we draw for a conclusion? Well, Jesus loves you. And Jesus died for your sin. And you're either a believer who it's important for you to learn your lesson and the lesson in here is to live to the glory of God, isn't it? And that the lesson here, live for the glory of God. Accept God's will in your life and live for the glory of God. You're either a blind man, and that's a person who can't see, but's willing to believe. Or you're a Pharisee, and you are looking for a reason to justify your unbelief. And all of these things are a reminder to us that Jesus is God and that He's truth. And in this example, the Apostle John has showed us that simple faith in Jesus Christ is the means for eternal life. Most of the Pharisees didn't receive eternal life. Some did. Nicodemus did. Others did. Most of the Pharisees just tried to justify their unbelief. Friend, where are they today? The disciples. Disciples learned their lesson. Where are they today? The blind man, he found out who Jesus was and believed. Where is he today? Heaven. Heaven. And he is still being used for an example of how to glorify God with your life. Now in this account, which had you rather be? Can't be Jesus. So would you like to be a blind man or the disciples or a Pharisee? I just want to be honest with you. Okay, so some would say disciples. I want to be honest with you. I want to be the blind man. And I think the disciples did too by the time they understood all this account. Why? Because Christian, it's one thing to try to justify and believe. It won't work. It's another thing entirely 
to learn your lesson. But it's a wonderful thing to come to a place where you believe and live to the glory of God. So how are you living? What is your life for? Why are you living? See, God made you for His glory. And the circumstances in your life are an opportunity to be a Pharisee, a disciple, or a blind man. I'd say two of them are pretty good uh, examples. But God helped me to get to be the blind man sometimes. And be able to live a life that has eternal ramifications to the glory of God. Dear God, help us to learn our lesson. And Lord, help us at times to be a blind man. Lord, if there would be any here today that would classify themselves as Pharisees, heaven help them, God. Show them their unbelief and their self-justification will not allow them to stand in your presence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, things are a little different this morning. We don't have our piano player. But the invitation is always open. And if you have a question about the message or if God's spoken to you and you need to respond to it, Will you see me personally? Would you say, Pastor, I have some questions, or God showed me this, and uh, I've responded in this way. And if I could be a help to you, I'd sure be glad for it. Let me just plug a couple of things just in case I forgot or you missed it. Uh, next Sunday evening, in the evening service, I'm going to be showing pictures of our uh, trip to Turkey and to Greece next Sunday evening. And gonna, that'll be in the evening service, and we're going to be giving a perspective of the gospel to the Gentiles, or the gospel to the Greeks, and I think it'll be a real blessing and a help to you. So don't forget about that. And uh, there was something else, and I forgot it, so you're dismissed. <laughs>